story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima cigarettes. Best of all long cigarettes brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A middle-aged businessman in your city is robbed and beaten senseless. The hold-up men escape. The victim refuses to report the crime. Your job? Investigate. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. You'll find they now cost the same. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette because it contains the finest domestic and Turkish tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild, with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. So compare Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima tomorrow. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, October 8th. It was overcast in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. It was 11.23 a.m. when we got to 700 South Hill Boulevard, the Butler Accordion Studios. What do you think? Oh, I don't know. It must be upstairs, I guess. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there it is. Main office, second floor. Yeah. Who is that, Joe? What? That portrait up there on the wall. Oh, yeah, just a minute. Some printing underneath here. A nice painting. Yeah, it says Damien, the father of the accordion, Vienna, 1829. Hmm. What do you know about that? Must be it down there, huh? Yeah. Want to try? Yeah. Yes, sir? Are you Lewis Butler? Yeah, that's right. And can I help you? Police officers, Mr. Butler. I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Is your name Friday? Yes, sir, that's right. This is my partner, Sergeant Romero. How do you do? I'm sorry, Sergeant. I told you on the phone. I just don't want to talk about it. We'd appreciate it if we could have your cooperation. It's a pretty important matter. Well, I'm the only one concerned in it, as far as I can see. I just as soon forget the whole thing. Besides, I got a pretty busy day ahead of me. Well, we'd like to straighten you out, Mr. Butler. It concerns a lot more people than just yourself. Now, we're not going to take much of your time. Just a few questions, that's all. I told you on the phone, Sergeant. I don't want to talk about it. Can't you just forget about the whole thing? It's only going to take a few minutes, sir. All right. Come in if you want. Thank you. Thank you. The place is in kind of a mess. Wife's away to mother's. Oh, you can sit down if you want. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Pepper, I'll feed you. Uh, just a minute. It's a nice cat you got there. Siamese? A little bit, yeah. It's my wife's. Don't care too much for cats myself. All right, Pepper, now wait a minute. Did you know that? Here you go, Pepper. That ought to hold you for a while. Look at that, Jill. Sure goes for that mail, huh? Yeah, it sure does. You're going to have to make it fast, Sergeant. I got an appointment for lunch downtown. All right, sir. I'd just like to have you elaborate on what Dr. Hart told us. Is he your family doctor, by the way? Yeah, that's right. He had no business calling you in the first place. I told him I didn't want it to get out. What did he tell you? He said you came to him for treatment night before last. He told him you had been beaten up and robbed. He treated you for cuts and bruises about the face and head. No, it was nothing. Didn't amount to anything. Well, was there actually a robbery, Mr. Butler? 
Believe me, Sergeant, it didn't amount to anything. I, I don't even want to go into it. How much did the robbery involve? Money, I mean. I'd rather not say. I don't want any fuss made about it. That's why I didn't report it. Just isn't worth it to me. We understand the holdup men took more than $800 from you. Wouldn't you like to get that money back? I don't want to be nasty about this thing, but I was the one who was held up. Now, if I don't want to press the case, I don't see why anyone else should worry about it. It was my money. How about the beating that Steve gave you? It's nothing serious. It's like I told you on the phone. I want to forget about the whole thing. Well, it must have involved more than just a few scratches from the looks of you, and the doctor had to treat you. Take my word for it, please. I'm all right. I don't want to press charges. I appreciate it if you'd give us some kind of an explanation, Mr. Butler. Why? I don't want to bother, that's all. There's nothing to explain. Well, you have to admit that this is a little unusual. Somebody beats you up, slugs you, takes $800 from you, and you don't want to do anything about it? You're going to have to excuse me a minute. I have one of my accordion students down the hall in the practice room. Almost time for him to go. I have to give him his lesson for next week. All right, sir, go right ahead. It'll only be a minute. How about that? Yeah. Acts like he's scared to death. Well, whoever it was, they gave him a going over. Half of his head and bandages, face all swollen. Sure something phony. Well, he's not going to be much help unless we can talk him into a crime report. Huh? Somebody's got to him. I'll bet on it. Oh, hi there, kitty. Hi, kitty. Uh, I've been thinking it over, officers. Uh, sorry I had to come out here go to all this trouble, but I just as soon forget the whole thing. I don't even want to talk about it if you don't mind. We don't mean to high pressure you, Butler, but we'd like some kind of an explanation. Well, can't you understand? I just don't want to make a big fuss about it. I'd like to have you go along with my feelings in the matter. It's my affair, isn't it? No, sir, it's ours, too. Half a dozen people like yourself have been beaten up and robbed in this neighborhood all in the last five weeks. Now, if we can find the thieves, we can put a stop to it. We can make sure the same thing doesn't happen to your neighbors. Well, they're going to have to look out for themselves. I'm not getting tied up in a big investigation. The neighbors don't worry about me. Freddy goes a little further than that. What? Huh? You've been beaten up and robbed once. How do you know it isn't going to happen again? Well, it's not, that's all. I'll make sure it doesn't. How? What's going to stop the same thieves from knocking you over again? Look, if it's all the same to you, I want to forget about this. I'm going to have to be running along. It's getting late. No, there's just one more thing, Butler. When the doctor was treating you the other night, this Dr. Hart, he says you told him that you knew who the hold-up men were. Now, is that right? No, he got it all mixed up. I didn't mean it that way. How did you mean it? I'm in a funny position. I just can't explain, that's all. I can't take the chance. Did the hold-up men threaten you? I can't talk about it. Give me a break, please. You're making a mistake, mister. Play ball with those thieves and they'll ruin you. It's not only me, it's my family, too. I'm not going to take the chance. If they threatened you and your family, you're taking more of a chance keeping quiet about it. They'll bleed you white, blackmail, robbery, anything you can think of. Now, this has happened before. Can't you see the spot I'm in? I know who they are. I know what they can do. i got a wife to think about. Would you put your family in that position? You're buying protection from a couple of hoods. Now, figure it out. How much is it worth? How far can you trust them? If you pick them up, they'll know I told you. I don't want anything to happen. Can't you see that I haven't any choice? What else can I do? Help us put the thieves where they belong. You'll have all the protection you need till they're locked up. It's a big order. I don't know. You and your wife will be under 24-hour guard. Now, that's a promise. How long would that have to go on? Long enough to bring them to trial and convict them. Now, how about it? They warned me about telling the police. They said they'd get both of us if I did, me and my wife. Now, they meant it, too. They'd get us. What can you do about it? Get them first. <laughs> After another hour of talking, we finally persuaded the robbery victim, Lewis Butler, to come downtown with us. He dictated a full statement about the holdup and filed a crime report. He told us he'd been robbed and slugged late at night a few blocks from his music studio. $820 had been taken from him by two bandits, both of whom were armed, both of whom he recognized. He said one of the men was a Marvin Carter, a former bartender at a neighborhood tavern. The other was Ralph Quincy, a merchant seaman. We went across the street and met with Deputy District Attorney Fred Henderson. The next day, the case was presented to the grand jury and a true bill was returned. The two suspects, Marvin Carter and Ralph Quincy, were indicted on one count of armed robbery. That afternoon, both of them were booked at the main jail and then released after posting a required bail of $10,000. 4.30 p.m., Ben and I went back to the office and met with Captain Didion. How are you making out on it? Pretty fair shape, Skipper. The arraignment's set for two weeks from Thursday. How about protection for the victim? Well, it's all set up. Butler and his wife are under 24-hour guard. Three teams of men on it. Mm. There's two thieves getting out on bail. It's not going to make it any easier. Who are you working with from the DA's office? Henderson. Seems to think we've got enough to convict both men. What makes them so sure? Well, for one thing, we got a line on a couple of good witnesses to the holdup. Excuse me. Robbery did in. Yeah, Mike. No, I'll check it before I leave. Right. What was that about, witness? A man by the name of Bartlett runs a drugstore. He and his son were in the neighborhood when Lewis Butler was held up. 
They're supposed to have spotted the two thieves running from the scene. Have you talked to them yet? Just over the phone. We've got an appointment with them at 6 o'clock tonight. Take your statement. I guess I don't have to tell you. Stay as close to this thing as you can. If we miss this time, we may not get another chance. You know as well as anyone how tough it's been reaching these thieves. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't be this far along if Butler didn't decide to cooperate and file charges. I wish I knew how many victims there are in this thing just like Butler. People we don't even know about, so scared they don't dare file charges. I guess there's a dozen of them anyway. I can't figure. People hire a police force on salary to protect them and their property, then they turn around and try to make a deal with a bunch of hoods, buy them off. How far have you gotten on the holdup gang? Well, how do you mean? The two men you've got, Tad, Carter, and Quincy. Anyone else working with them? Possible, not sure yet. Both Carter and Quincy have juvenile records. That's about it. We're still checking on them. Robbery, did he? Yeah, Tom. Mm hmm. That's right. No, I'll tell them. They're here with me now. Right. Thank you. It started already. How's that? The victim, Lewis Butler. He got a phone call at his house a few minutes ago. Yeah. Figured it was one of the holdup gang. They gave Butler a choice. What did he say? Either he drops the charges or they'll kill him. <laughs> 5.30 p.m. Captain Didion issued orders that the two suspects in the case, Marvin Carter and Ralph Quincy, be placed under 24-hour surveillance. An additional team of men was assigned to guard Lewis Butler. Each officer was carefully instructed to take all possible precautions to prevent the robbery victim and his wife from being harmed in any way. 6 p.m. Ben and I met with the two witnesses to the holdup. A drugstore proprietor, Sam Bartlett, and his teenage son, Harold. They told us that they'd been in the immediate vicinity the night Butler was robbed and that they'd gotten a good look at the two gunmen as they ran from the scene of the holdup. Bartlett and his son Harold identified the suspects as Marvin Carter and Ralph Quincy. Statements were taken and both witnesses were warned to maintain absolute secrecy about their part in the case. Next day, we made arrangements to have the druggist and his son subpoenaed for the Superior Court arraignment. Six days went by. Thursday, October 17th, 8 a.m., we checked in the office and found the message waiting for us. What is it, Joe? The druggist's son, Harold Bartlett. What about him? Found him in an alley, 3 o'clock this morning. What? You know, slugged and beaten. Late that afternoon, Ben and I received permission from the doctors to visit briefly with our witness, 17-year-old Harold Bartlett. His injuries were painful, but not critical. The beating he'd received was nothing less than brutal. His left forearm had been broken, and he'd been beaten viciously about the face and chest. He told us that he was on his way home from a neighborhood movie just before midnight when two men jumped him from behind on a deserted street. Well, I drove around some, maybe five or ten minutes. There must have been at least three men in the car. Well, why do you say that? Well, there were two in the back seat with me. Somebody else had to be doing the driving. Mm-hmm. And it had to be a sedan and a club coupe. I guess so, yeah. After he drove around a while, he stopped the car, and then they began slugging me. Didn't say a word the whole time, just started slugging me. I asked him why, and just kept slugging me. I see. At first, I think they were hitting me with their fists. And it felt like something a lot, a lot harder, a piece of iron or metal or something. That's when I grabbed the cloth off of my face, and I started to holler. Mm-hmm. What happened then? Oh, I... Yes, nobody heard me. Nobody came anyway. One of the men swore at me and grabbed my arm. It was something. Sure sore. They didn't say anything to you all this time? No. I told just before they pushed me out of the car. It seemed like I was at that car for hours. When they started to talk to you, Harry, what did they say? It was about that robbery my father and me saw. The one they talked to us about last week? Mm -hmm. What did they say about it? I said, maybe this will help you keep your mouth shut, stay out of other people's business. They said that a couple of times. They said a lot more had happened to Dad and me if we went to the police, if we were witnesses at that trial. Do you remember the men called each other by name? No, I don't. I don't remember anyway. Well, son, you remember when we talked to you and your father last week, we told you to say nothing about the case to anyone. Mm -hmm. I remember, Sergeant. I guess it's my fault. Well, did you tell other people that you were a witness in the case? Did you mention it in public? I guess I did, yeah. I didn't think it was that important. I guess I... I talked about it quite a bit. I'm sorry. It's my fault. That's 
all right, Harry. If you remember it from now on, it'll save a lot more trouble. I remember, Sergeant. Those two men last night scared me for a while. I guess most of it was talking, huh? How do you mean, sir? They never warned me about staying away from the cops. They said they'd kill me and my dad if we were witnesses. Mm-hmm. They were probably just trying to scare us, huh? They were fooling. Well, you had a sample last night, son. Yeah. Were they fooling? After we left Harry Bartlett, we went back to the office and arranged for a 24-hour guard to be assigned to the teenage boy and his father. A thorough investigation of the attack on the boy failed to turn up any leads. On the surface, the two robbery suspects, Carter and Quincy, were not involved. During the week that followed, we heard of no further threats or attacks, either on the victim, Lewis Butler, or the witnesses involved in the case. Ben and I worked with Deputy District Attorney Henderson, preparing the case against the two suspects. Two days before the trial opened in Superior Court, we got an urgent call. Yeah, I know, but how did it happen? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're all right, Tom. Thanks. Well, what's the trouble? Couldn't be worse. No victim. What do you mean? Mr. and Mrs. Butler have disappeared. listening to Dragnet. From beginning to end, Dragnet is the authentic story of your police force in action. Now, from beginning to end, the Fatima story. Actual convincing proof that in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos. The finest domestic and Turkish varieties, extra mild and superbly blended to give you a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, round, perfect cigarettes. Rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Manufactured in the newest and most modern of all cigarette factories. Quality even to the appearance of the bright, clean, golden yellow package. Carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. Because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma... More long cigarette smokers are now insisting on Fatima than ever before. So if you smoke a long cigarette, compare Fatima. You'll find they now cost the same. But your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Insist on Fatima. Start enjoying the quality king-size cigarette. Fatima. Best of all, long cigarettes. Tuesday, November 5th, 9 a.m. The trial of robbery suspects Marvin Carter and Ralph Quincy opened in Superior Court, Department 88. The complaining witness, Louis Butler, failed to appear. For two solid days, we'd been busy checking all of the Butler's friends and relatives in the city. They couldn't help. Each time the butlers had left their residence, they'd been under surveillance. We'd had an understanding with them that in the event that they were in their automobile, and for some reason the officers assigned to them lost them in traffic, the butlers would immediately return to their home. On the night of November 3rd, under the pretext of going to a neighborhood theater, the butlers made a right-hand turn from a left-hand lane of traffic, so it became obvious that they were trying to elude the officers following them. A check was made at their home as prearranged, and they failed to return. When they failed to appear for the trial, a bench warrant was issued by Superior Court for the missing couple. Deputy District Attorney Henderson asked the court to grant a delay in order to find the butlers. It was granted. In the meantime, we'd gotten out a broadcast and an APB. Missing persons detail helped out in the search. Still no sign. Tuesday, November 12th, 11 a.m., Deputy D.A. Henderson phoned us from the Hall of Justice. When was that, Fred? Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. What do you have to say? The attorney for Carter and Quincy asked the court for dismissal. No complaining witness. Well, the judge rule on it yet? Yeah. Case dismissed. No matter how guilty the two men might have seemed, there was nothing further anyone could do. Without a complaining witness, our case was finished. The two suspects, Carter and Quincy, were released from custody. In a few days, Quincy left town for the east. Carter remained in the city. The search for Mr. and Mrs. Butler went on. No sign of either one of them. December came, and then the Christmas holidays, New Year's. 
On January 16th, Lewis Butler suddenly reappeared back in town and surrendered on the bench warrant. They explained to the judge that because of the numerous threats on their lives just before the trial, they were afraid to appear and that they left the state without telling anyone. The judge gave them a lecture and a warning and dismissed charges. Another month passed, February and then March. On April 2nd, we got word from Denver, Colorado, that one of our former robbery suspects, Ralph Quincy, had shot and killed a 24-year-old policeman while attempting a robbery in that city. Quincy was tried and convicted of murder and received a life term. In the meantime, we'd heard little or nothing about the other former robbery suspect, Marvin Carter. Another two months passed. Spring months wore on into summer. Monday, July 8th, 8 a.m. Friday, Romero, see you a minute. Yes, Skipper. You want to sit down? I got something for you. Uh, yeah. A hold-up victim, man by the name of Sheridan, came in late last night, filed this crime report here. Have a look. Thank you. Let's see, Joe. You can notice there it happened in the same area where we had that rash of hold-ups last fall. Yeah, I see. Victim robbed and beaten. Suspects used the same approach, same M.O., followed it right down the line. Yeah. Victim warned not to contact police. Bodily harm threatened if victim did so. How about the descriptions of the hold-up men here? The victim pretty sure about them? Gaffney handled the report. The victim said he got a good look at one of the thieves. Gaffney gave him a bunch of mug shots to look at. Yeah. Here's the one he picked out of the lot. Oh, thanks. Have a look, Joe. Marvin Carter. As soon as the robbery report had come in, an immediate check had been made of Marvin Carter's last known address, an apartment in the West Pico District. The landlord revealed that the suspect had moved at least two months before. We got out a broadcast and an APB on him. Together with Sergeants Gonzalez and Henry, Ben and I started on a systematic check of all of Carter's known friends, relatives, and associates. After that, we started on the places he was known to frequent, Hotels, bars, restaurants, no luck. Two weeks went by. There were no further reports of robberies where the M.O. of the criminal matched that of Carter's. Tuesday, July 26, 2 p.m. We got a call from one of our informants, uh, Bertie Simmons, who told us that he might have some information for us. He said it concerned Marvin Carter. He told us he'd meet us at MacArthur Park on the 6th Street side at 2.30 p.m. 2.50 p.m. You'll have to excuse me, Sergeant. Sorry I'm late. I have to move from that other place. Things haven't been going too good for me. That's all right, Bertie. What's the matter? No luck with the horses? Yeah, a lot of luck. It's all bad. If there's a pig in the race, I have to bet on him every time. Getting so I can't even pick him to show anymore. I don't know. What else is new with you, Bertie? No job yet? No, but I'm still looking. Been down around some of the joints, South Main, Alameda, keeping an ear to the ground. Mm Mm-hmm. Want to smoke? Yeah, thanks. Don't mind if I do. There you go light for you. Hmm. What have you heard, Bertie? Anything that'll help? That Marvin Carter, you're still looking for him, aren't you? That's right. Any rumble? I heard it last night having a beer downtown. I knew you fellows were in a little bind on the thing. I always like to help you when you're in a bind. Well, what'd you hear, Bert? Carter's still in town, hiding out. <clears throat> like I say, I always like to help you out when you need it. Mm-hmm. I know what it is to be in a bind. That's when you appreciate help most. I'm kind of in a bind right now. A little short, you know. A couple of dollars, Bert. That's all I have on me. Will I help you out any? Saved my life, Sergeant. Tell you the truth, I didn't know where dinner was coming from tonight. No need telling you. I appreciate it. What was this you heard about Carter? Still in town. There's a place down by Venice, near the beach. Mm Mm-hmm. Carter's been seen there once, twice lately. It's a little seafood joint. Beer and clams. Down by the beach. Well, now, is that somebody's story, or is it the real thing? The real thing, Sergeant. You know me better than that. No phony leads from me. Where's Carter supposed to be staying down there, you know? Well, I don't, I don't, I guess. What do you mean? This mooch who told me about Carter last night, he didn't know the address, but he described the place Carter's supposed to be hiding out in. I know the joint he means. But you don't know the address. No, but I can point out the place he means. It's a shack right along the speedway down there, down by the beach. Mm -hmm. You want to run down there with us now? Sure, I'll point it out for you. I'm not going near it, though. Why do you say that? Don't want to mix with it, that's all. I got the word. What do you mean? Carter. Won't be an easy one to take. How do you know? He's got a gun. 2.55 p.m. Along with our informant, Bertie Simmons, Ben and I drove down to the beach town of Venice. Bertie pointed out a brown wooden frame cottage where Carter was supposed to be hiding out. 
While Bertie waited in the car, Ben and I checked it out. There was nobody at home, but there was plenty of evidence inside the cottage that Carter was living there. I went back down the street to where we parked our car. I kept an eye on the cottage while Ben got to a phone to call the office. Pretty down here, huh, Sergeant? Yeah, it's a nice day. I don't get out in the air enough. I think that's my trouble. Some of this good ocean air makes you feel like a million. Yeah. Did you notice the place where your partner went to phone down the street there? Yeah, what about it? You see the sign, Beer and Clan? Right over the door? Beer and Clan? Yeah, mm hmm. Best in the city, I know. I've been there. Only great. Good beer for a dime, fresh clam, nothing better. You like clams? Yeah, they're all right once in a while. What am I going to do if you two have to wait here all night? Well, we'll get you back to town, Bert. We'll figure out something for you. All right, Ben. Did you get a hold of the captain? Yeah. Marvin Carter was picked up downtown 20 minutes ago. What? Yeah, he's driving a rented car. A traffic unit picked him up. Will they tab him on his description? Not at first. The reason they noticed him was because he was double parked on a busy street and they pulled him over and got a better look at him. I did it. Any trouble with him? None at all. Got him booked at main jail. Say, that's sure too bad, and what do you mean, Bert? It's your case, isn't it? How long have you fellas been working on it? Mm, just about a year, huh, Joe? Yeah, just about. Coming all this way for nothing. You're ready to make the pinch and somebody else does it for you. Must be kind of disappointing, huh? All that time, all that work? No, Carter's in jail. That's the main thing. Well, I guess we better drive back in, huh, Ben? Yeah. Uh, say, just a minute, Sergeant. No use coming all this way for nothing. One if you do me a favor. What's that, Bert? That sign down the street. What? The blue and white sign, Beer and Clam. One if you could drop me off right in front. Beer and Clam? Oh, yeah, Bert, all right. Sure nice of you. Just like I was saying. What's that? No use coming all this way for nothing. <laughs> just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 29th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 86, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, let me tell you how to size up king-size cigarettes. First, take a Fatima, and then any other king-size. Now, side by side, the two look alike, but they're not, because no other king-size cigarette has Fatima quality. That's right. In Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality that results from a blend of the finest domestic and Turkish tobaccos. Quality that gives you extra mildness, a much better flavor and aroma. Remember, if you haven't tried Fatima yet, take my advice. Buy a pack. Smoke Fatimas and you'll discover what I know. In Fatima, the difference is quality. <laughs> Marvin Lawrence Carter was tried and convicted on several counts of first-degree robbery and was sentenced to the state penitentiary where he is now serving his term. First-degree robbery is punishable by imprisonment from five years to life. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Lyle Rooks, editor of Radio Television Mirror. The readers of Radio Television Mirror have chosen Dragnet, the favorite program of its type for 1950. I am privileged to present the citation to you on behalf of the editors and readers of Radio Television Mirror throughout the nation. Thank you, Miss Rooks. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portions transcribed from Los Angeles. Stay tuned for Counter Spy next over many NBC stations.